Okay, folks, back for a Monday edition of the Investigative Journal. Greg Anthony here, as always. And, you know, I want to start out talking about a little baseball, Major League Baseball. And I know that doesn't really coincide with the subject matter here, but I always said the Jesuit Vatican New World Order will never end the world when the World Series is on the horizon or the Super Bowl. So if these two organizations keep going, you know what? We may be here for thousands and thousands of more years. So all of you people out there who are preaching this doom and gloom about the end of the world, please, every generation I've ever studied, look, going back to zero time, says they're the last generation that are going to exist in the world. And it just seems to go on and on and on, doesn't it? Now, we may be able to make our stay here on Earth a little more pleasant, but that's about the best you can hope for, isn't it really? Well, anyway, a little baseball. Baseball history was made this year because there were two ties in the three divisions, out of the three divisions in the National League. Ties to see who's going to get first place in that division. That's never happened before in baseball, whether you're a baseball fan or not. And if you're not a baseball fan, just turn the show off. And I'm telling you something, you're missing out on one of the great, is pastimes in the world. Go to the ball game, buy a hot dog, drink a couple beers, and it'll only cost you about $350 now. When I was a kid, I remember one summer I went to Wrigley Field, the friendly confines in Chicago. I went to, I think, about 30 home games, and they used to cost 75 cents to get in. Yes, and I was too young to drink beer, but boy, I remember having a nice bottle of 7 Up for about a dime. <laughs> Those days are over over. Go to Dodger Stadium with your family of four. You better take uh, your checkbook with you. And uh, I always go to Dodger Stadium and say, can I uh, pay on the payment plan? <laughs> It'll cost you a lot of money. But anyway, baseball is a beautiful sport. And uh, I tend to watch it now just on TV and on the comfort of my own living room. It's a lot cheaper. And even though these cable TV stations are a ripoff, uh, it's a little better. But anyway, so we have a real historic thing going on right now. In the American League, which is the, um, which is the grandfather of all leagues, uh, the American League, that's all set. So there's going to be a wild card playoff for the top, the, uh, the two teams that didn't win their division that had the best record. And they will then square off, the winner of that will square off with the best team, the record of the best team in the American League. That's the Boston Red Sox. And then the Yanks will take on the, um, the winner of the other division. And then it goes from the division to the National League, or the American League uh, championship game to the World Series. But now we're mired in a problem here in the National League. Two of the three divisions ended up in a tie. In the Central, the Cubs, who blew it this year, I mean, I've never seen, uh, my Cubbies have won it two years in a row. But this year, their bats were anemic. Let me tell you something. I've never seen a team uh, go hot and cold so much. If they could have just scored three or four runs in a game about four or five times, ten times, they don't won this division going away. But they changed their hitting coach, and I believe he won't be there next year because somebody's got to take the fall, even though it's the players swinging the bats. And the poor manager, uh, he had no choice. I mean, what is he going to do? If you don't hit the ball, you don't score runs, you're not going to win, even though the pitching was great. And they had to play the Brewers, who caught him on the last day of the season in a playoff today. Now, guess what happened? The Cubs lost 3-1. to one. Again, their bats were cold. Three hits. And the Brewers go on to win the National League Central Division. They get a few days off. They wait for the winner of the Dodger Rockies series in the West, who ended up in a tie, both with a 91 and 71 record. you surprised how much I know about baseball, huh? I know more about baseball than I do the Jesuits. But anyway, 91-71. Uh, they're now in the, I believe, the bottom of the third, 0-0. Zero, zero. And the loser will go to Chicago because the Cubs had a better record than the Rockies or the Dodgers. And they will square off to see who is the wild card team that gets a chance 
to play the Milwaukee Brewers, who had the best record in the National League. And boy, the Cubs are chomping at the bit. But they have to get by the loser of the Dodger-Rocky game today. Now, the winner, of course, goes uh, right to the National League, uh, wins their division, and waits for the, I believe they had the best record. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, the other division team, well, whatever. They're waiting for, uh, they will play on Thursday. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, you got great baseball coming up. Of course, that's going to take a few weeks. Then you got the World Series. And so we got at least a month or two before the uh, world comes to an end. Yep, the Jesuits will not blow the world up during the World Series. Let me bet on that. And the reason is they're baseball fans, I find out. Yes, they go to a lot of games, and they all have front row seats when they go. That's really weird. I wonder if they pay these people off just like they pay off politicians. Probably. And they, they're they just a lowly priest. They don't have any money. How can they afford $1,000 box seats? That's, that's weird. So we don't have to worry about that. And then I hear that the other side of the Jesuits are football fans. So they'll be following uh, the football schedule all the way up till when? Uh, Super Bowl Sunday in February, 1st of February. So the world won't end till then. But that's the time you got to worry. Between February, when the Super Bowl is over, and when the baseball season starts in April. So if you're worried about the world coming to end or bombs blowing up, it's going to be between February or April. And then there'll be a hiatus in both leagues, and just like they did in World War II. And uh, we'll have to wait and see if America exists after that. If not, they, they make a World Baseball Association, can't they? If there's going to be a one-world order, a one-world government, there's got to be a one-world baseball league. And what, what's the difference? I mean, if you look at the baseball teams here now, most of the, you know, there's more foreign players than American players. We got people from China. We got people from North Korea. We got people from South, no, South Korea, not North Korea yet. Because Chim, uh, that, that dictator, won't let them play baseball there. No, because they don't have lights in Korea. And so they can't play baseball. And they don't allow the people there to have grass. So they don't play baseball in North Korea. But the South Korea has, some, has a couple uh, major leaguers. In China, of course. Japan might as well be the Japanese league. And then, of course, you've got uh, South America and Central America. Man, you've got more... Uh, I can name every baseball team, and I'd say half the roster is Hispanics. And that's good. They're great ball players. And another thing they do well are they're good jockeys. If you ever go to the racetrack, you're going to find a lot of Hispanic jockeys because they're smaller, and jockeys can't be more than 110 pounds, right? They got a lot of Hispanic jockeys, got a lot of Hispanic baseball players. They haven't yet uh, really saturated football. Uh, but anyway. Uh, there, there's a few there as well. So don't worry. Once the world is over, as we know it, it'll be the One World Baseball Association. And uh, where will they be playing? Boy, there's going to be a lot of traveling. No, they're going to have like the China League. Then they'll have the Japan League. They'll, they'll segregate it off into four quadrants. North American Baseball League. Then there'll be the Asian. And then they'll play for the World Championship. Well, we call it the World Series now. What is that? How can it be the World Series if it's only the American teams that play? Are we being a bit presumptuous that we're the world here? Sounds funny. World Series. Okay. Super Bowl. I mean, what's so super about the Super Bowl? You know, I don't think there's anything super about it. First of all, it's got the worst entertainment in the world. Every year they bring out Madonna dressed, uh, you know, they're going to roll her out in a wheelchair one day, you know, and she'll be, you know, doing her thing, threatening to blow up the White House, etc. So, I don't know why we call it the World Series if we're only in America now. It should be the USA Series, right? But when they started this whole thing years ago, playing baseball, we were the World Series. Nobody else played. I mean, in Central America... They still were catching baseballs with, uh, you know, milk cartons. And then they would have to, like, get a rock and weave it, put some thread around it, and throw that. 
That's how it was when baseball started in America. Look at how they've advanced, you know? And we say that the cultures in, in uh, Central and South America are third world. No. They play in our baseball league. They're first world. And now the World Series means probably the World Series. Everybody plays from the world, right? We've got people from all over the world. Even Australia has some major league players. And uh, the one group that's taken a hit is the blacks. The black American players are losing ground in baseball. There's not as many. Their percentages are down. But do we hear all these uh, you know, people like Cory Booker, a senator, who's always saying there's racism in America? I don't hear them say it about baseball. But could we consider it racism because there aren't as many black players now? No. The reason is they're not as good as the Hispanic players. It's that simple. Or the white players. And some white players are better than Hispanic players. And some Hispanics are better than blacks. And there's some blacks who are better than both whites and Hispanics. So it's the merit system in baseball. What can you do for me today? Not like uh, when you want to get a job now or if you want to go to school. I'd want to be a black woman. If I had to come back as something else and I wanted a really great job, I'd want to be a black woman because they have to hire me you know, under these stupid guidelines of racial equality, which means the merit system is out the window. So who's being discriminated against? White, white men. Yeah, of course. I'm going to start a movement. Yes. White men for equality in America. But anyway, I digress to a point where it gets a bit annoying to listen to my own voice. So I wanted to start out by playing ISIS, CIA, and the Vatican Connection. Of course, I'm going to use Bill Hughes to do it because he's a sane man and he's in a sane position to do it. He's written two books called The Secret Terrorists and The Enemy Unmasked, which I've read. They're very small books. That's the only reason I read them. It's only, they're very tiny, like 30 pages each. I can handle that. Anything over 100, I do not even take out of the bookstore. I look at it and I size it up. I said, if I can fit it between my little finger, now if I can fit it, if it's more than a one inch big, I will not read the book. Too long. I've got better things to do. So I like Bill Hughes' books. They're very tiny, but filled with a lot of good things. So let me turn on Bill before you turn me off, or I turn myself off. Here's Bill Hughes. Sure, Danny. Number one, Danny, it's great to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, just, just loving it. Uh, the two books I wrote, Danny, one was The Secret Terrorist. The other one is The Enemy Unmasked. Uh, currently, Danny, in print, there's about five... Bill, why are you calling me Danny? <laughs> He's doing another interview. Five million, and uh, they're in about six, six to eight different languages. So, I just praise God, Danny, that uh, for the opportunity to have written them. You know, Bill, we do have something in common, because as I've read your books... I see that there's an enemy that you're unmasking in there, and I've written a couple books as well. Uh, many of you out there may be familiar with the books that I've penned, and the first is The Virgin Mary Dead or Alive. It's The Virgin Mary Dead or Alive. This book is about three million that have been printed in seven different languages, even Arabic. Awesome. <laughs> and so they've gone all over the world as well, and the second one that I wrote it's called The Final Inquisition. If you look closely at the cover of this book, it's unmasking an enemy that I believe is working through a religious guise. And we're going to get more to this as we have this discussion today. But Bill, we've come together here today because there's great problems in the United States of America and France. We've seen ISIS, the radical Islam, you know, radical Muslims that are murdering, killing, beheading people. This is a group of assassinations that we've never seen before. Uh, my family's alarmed. You know, people are worried that if you can't even go to a Christmas party without the fear of 14 people being murdered and assassinated right here in our state in California, in San Bernardino. You know, Bill, I want to talk about this. I mean, terrors here in America now, and, and I think this video needs to be made. People need to know the truth. Well, Danny, let me tell you, the, um, 
there's there's so much talk about terror, and of course, because of what happened in San Bernardino, everybody's just on edge. Yes. But Danny, what what I know you and I want to look at today is is that there's this is all a smokescreen. This is a front, and the world is uniting together, Danny, to oppose what appears to be a common enemy. Good point. Let's so, have a prayer and let's read a scripture in the Bible before we begin. Good. Father in heaven, I just ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon Bill and me. Uh, Lord, we need your power. We need your strength. We want to glorify you in this video here. So, Father, just bless us now and we just pray that heaven will be glorified in what we do. Use our minds, our lips, our Father, the information that we have accumulated and and help us, Lord, in presenting this in a way that others will understand the hour in which we are living. Amen. So bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, the Bible says we have a, I love this more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Lord has given us prophecy. We have the great book of Daniel and the Revelation that exposes, I believe, powers and how the devil himself is working through the kings of the earth, f through false religious powers and, and in ways that we don't even expect. So, so, Bill, let's talk today. Let's spend our time now getting to this very heart of the matter that you just said, that there's a common... There's, a, there's an enemy out there that wants us to think there's a common villain. To bring the powers of the earth together as a, a new world order, a one world order. And we see the religious community also pressing together because this villain is killing Christians. I remember in Roseburg, Oregon, where they had this, this uprising where a militant came in with his rifle and, and was asking the people... What's your religion? What's your religion? Asking if they were Muslim or whether they were Christians, and if they answered they were Christians, they were shot. Bill, we need to talk about this now. As, as we look at these, this picture up here of terror in America, what's going on, Bill? Danny, it's very clear in Bible prophecy that there is an enemy. The Bible, of course, uh, and, and we're all familiar with it, they call it the Antichrist. Right. Well, Danny, in Revelation chapter 17, we are introduced to a power that the Bible clearly portrays, Danny, that is behind the, the leaders of the world, the churches of the world, the merchants of the world, and is actually fomenting, Danny, crisis, terror, and war to regain control of the entire world. So you're making it sound like, according to Bible prophecy, that there is an agenda and there's a power behind the agenda and behind that power is Satan himself. Absolutely, Danny. Absolutely. And Danny, I think it, it comes so clear in Revelation 17. Because you have, Danny, in Revelation 17, verse 1, at the end of the verse, it says, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So, Danny, we have this impure woman the, of whom the Bible says in Isaiah 1, in Jeremiah chapter 3, in Ezekiel chapter 16. Danny, whenever a church went into apostasy, it was referred to as a whore or an impure woman. So we have here, Danny, in Revelation 17, an apostate church. Now the Bible, and Danny, all of the great reformers, they didn't agree on a lot of things. But one thing they did agree on was who the great whore was. Now we're talking about 
Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. We're talking about John Calvin. We're talking about Ulrich Zwingli, William Tyndale. Danny, we are talking about the great reformers throughout Europe, and they all agreed on who the great whore was in Revelation chapter 17. You know, Bill, you said that that a woman depicts, as it were, an apostate church. That it, it refers to a church in apostasy. And I just wanted to share verse 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Okay. <laughs> It's not a good woman. No, no. She's killing the saints. She's killing God's people. Absolutely. You know, Danny, in Revelation 18, verse 24, it even takes it further, and it connects, Danny, with our slide up here about terror in America. Verse 24, Revelation 18 says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, Danny, something went on in San Bernardino last week. Amen. Something went on in Paris yes. a few weeks ago. And, Danny, we see there's organization to these mass killings. Mm -hmm. So, Revelation 17 and 18, Danny, says that this apostate church is involved in mass killing, in terror, in war, to create a world, oh. Danny, where they can regain their lost power. That's an excellent point you're making right now. So this would imply to me that the ISIS, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist groups can be the part of the ploy of this apostate woman. Absolutely, Danny. And we're going to see very clearly, Danny, as we unfold this, this interview, that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, had their origin, Danny. They were created back several decades ago. They were created by this apostate church in Revelation 17. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage, Danny, our, our viewers mm -hmm. to just stay with us because we're going to see clearly that ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Danny, they were created by this great whore. Let's do it. Okay. Okay, we're going to do that in the uh, second half hour here. Continue. And uh, I'd like to also say that I've drawn many, many connections between the Jesuits and the creation of ISIS. Not only the creation of it, but also the, uh, the manipulation of it, the... Uh, continuation of it, also helping to fund ISIS as well as organize things so that this war on terror could continue. And there's always going to be an enemy, correct? And the enemy right now is the huge world terror problem that is stripping away your rights in order for, like he was saying, this apostate church as well as their secular uh, politicians and countries uh, working with them to create this one world order where we're all slaves and they're basically the owners or the captains of the ship and that's one ship you don't want to be sailing on because for you it may be the last voyage you ever take. You're listening to uh, Greg Anthony on the investigative journal. I'm playing an interview done by Danny Vieira and Bill Hughes. Bill was on my show many, many times over the years. And we'll be back in three minutes on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. <laughs> 